Professor Yarborough teaches and conducts research on a wide range of issues relating to African American literature and to US literature and culture more broadly. Par particular topics on which he focuses in his classes and scholarship include African American literature before World War I, the representation of slavery in American culture, Black writers and radical politics in the US, and the construction of race in American film and popular music. Uh, in this presentation, Professor Yarborough will take us through examining the roots of ideas regarding alleged racial difference in the institution of chattel slavery. He also discusses how anti-Black stereotypes grounded in justifications for slavery persisted in the United States after emancipation. And I just want to let students know too, you know, there's gonna be some terms that um, are gonna come to you that Professor Yarborough will be explaining, um, but as, um, your, uh, as you've been taught, you know, taking notes, making sure you grab some of the, the important concepts, um, in, even some of the, the terms that I mentioned today, what is, what is chattel slavery? Um, what is it? What are anti-black stereotypes? And some of these terms to jot them down and make sure that at the end of this lecture, you come away with some key terms that you can unpack in, in, in talking about uh, what race is. Um, and so without further ado, um, Professor Gabro. Uh, you might have to unmute yourself. Muted, unmuted. Uh... Am I, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Richard Yarborough and I'm a professor at UCLA uh, in the English department and in the Department of African American Studies. Um, and I'm pleased to have the chance to talk to you uh, today. Uh, thank goodness I'm a morning person. Uh, otherwise I'm not sure I could make any sense. Um, I know that some of you are reading Iola Leroy right now, uh, the novel by Francis Hart in a course that I do on early African-American literature. Um, and when I teach the book, I cover, I feel like I have to cover a decent amount of historical background. And I thought that it would be useful for me to cover here some of what I share with my students um, when I'm uh, teaching that and other early materials, because I think that one of the difficult things when you read the book is how do you get a sense of the issues around race that Harper is dealing with um, in her time period, which is the 1890s, uh, early 1890s when the book came out. Um, in order to do that, uh, we need to go back in time um, and try to get a grasp on how the whole idea of blackness uh, came to be understood in the United States. And that in turn means we need to talk about slavery. I mean, it, it can't really uh, uh, pull those two ideas apart. Um, it's a lot to cover in uh, the time that I have, um, but I'll dive in. And uh, uh, I know I might be going quickly over some things. I have some PowerPoint slides, if I can get them to, to work, uh, that might help. Uh, but I do wanna leave some time for questions at the end. Um, the first thing that I wanna highlight um, with regard to the history of African-Americans is probably the most obvious, and even in the title or the label African-American, and that is we're talking about people of African descent, people whose ancestors are from Africa. Um, therefore, in order to understand how the category of blackness came to be understood in the United States, you have to take into account the image of Africa. And I say image uh, because Africa, as it was largely understood in Western European culture, was more a product of the imagination than it was a real place. Um, you know, people talk about Africa like it's one nation, right? I mean, you could pick up the United States and drop it in the um, African continent and it wouldn't touch a coast just in terms of scale. Um, sometimes we do the same things when we talk about Asia. I mean, it collapses important distinctions. So my point is, is that um, when a lot of these early thinkers um, in Western culture referred to Africa, they were referring to something that I'm suggesting was an imagined place. Um, and since roughly the 15th century in Western European culture, this symbolic imagined Africa uh, had been associated with 
a slew of negative ideas. Uh, we'll uh, touch on some of them. Uh, and that's, that's independent of the, even before the uh, initiation uh, of the full scale Atlanta slave trade. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is that um, there's a intersection of a whole range of vectors, race, the idea of Africa, the idea of blackness, slavery, and other, um, there are a couple of other factors I want to identify. These things all come into play. Uh, one of those other factors, and I can't stress it enough, is Christianity. Uh, it plays a crucial role in this dynamic um, because from a religious standpoint, uh, Africa was seen by Western Europeans as pagan, as heathen, as barbarous, um, and, and as sin, sinful. Uh, it was viewed, and this is a cliche, and thankfully I hope it doesn't, none, it doesn't sound familiar to any of you, but when I was growing up, I even heard it sometimes on TV, in movies, they'd refer to Africa as the dark continent. And again, a very stereotypical collapsing of an extremely complex and diverse place. And even the reference of dark there is, is a sense of threat or mystery. Um, what's crucial um, is the extent to which, certainly through Harper's time, um, one's humanity was defined in terms of one's being a Christian. In other words, Christianity um, within Western culture, especially within Western Europe, was virtually the only game in town. If you were not Christian, you were somehow on the margins. Um, and in the case of Africans who clearly were not largely not Christian, um, there was even some question posed about the extent to which they were fully human. When you take into account the extent to which blackness had been so evil from a religious standpoint, you can see that the identification of the non-Christian Africans with blackness because of their dark skin, that's slot in a negative way um, as uncivilized and in some quarters in Western Europe as uh, maybe inhuman. Um, another crucial factor is of course the institution of slavery. And um, as Barrios mentioned the, the term chattel slavery, uh, slavery has existed in many cultures throughout history. Um, slavery as it developed uh, under the Western European colonial pattern uh, and especially within the British or American system um, is often referred to as chattel slavery. The word chattel, C-H-A-T-T-E-L uh, means property. And that is that the Africans, those who were part of that system, were viewed as property. They were not necessarily recognized for their humanity. Um, it's no accident that slavery of that kind emerged with the uh, emergence of um, the capitalism as the dominant economic system in, um, in this period. Um, slavery and ongoing legacy of slavery helped to shape race relations in the United States, and it informs the ways racial identities were constructed during uh, Francis Harper's time, and I would argue still today. Um, I want to say something about language. I'm gonna try, to, I think I could, um, I don't think I can, no, it says host disabled, so I can't share my screen. Um, it should work now. It should okay, work. let me try. Yep, magic. Uh, Yes, perfect. We can see it. Okay. Um, uh, there's some key terms I want to identify. Um, okay. Um, because one of the major obstacles that we have in uh, addressing these issues of race um, productively is the fact that the very concept of race is complicated and it's very, very slippery. It means different things in different contexts. And our language is really, really imprecise. It's been that way for a while and it may continue to be that way. And I've given you some terms on the left that um, we sometimes use almost interchangeably. We'll say race sometimes, we'll refer to color, we'll say nationality, we'll, we'll say ethnicity. And all those things are very shifting in terms of what is um, connoted by them. 
And, but sometimes we use them interchangeably. We'll say, what's your race or what that person race is or what color are they? Uh, what are their, what's their ethnicity? Um, and notice how often we take things for granted in, ter in terms of the clarity of what we mean by those terms. With regard to, um, and this applies to all racial categories, but with specific regard to blackness, who is black, right? Is black a color? Is it a nationality? Is it a racial marker? Is it a, and that's why I put the word culture over here, is it a cultural identity? Does it make sense to talk about Africa as if it's just one place? Is African a race? Is black equal African? Um, one might add that the labels black and white are both really problematic. I mean, what is white? Who is white? Is white equal Western Europe? Is white equal American? But there are Americans who aren't white. So black and white are both figures of speech, and that is they stand for ideas and characteristics that shift depending upon the historical moment, depending upon who's talking, depending upon the person that you may be talking about. And just as an example, there are some groups um, whose relationships to whiteness has shifted radically over time. Um, during uh, Francis Harper's uh, era, the late 19th century, in Western Europe and in the United States, many people viewed Jews as a non-white race. Uh, there have been times where the Irish were viewed as marginal in racial terms. Um, the fact remains is that we haven't got a more precise language because these ideas are so slippery um, and complex. I guess what I would urge us, and this is what I tell my students, is that we just keep in mind the limits of these terms. We're gonna use them, um, but realize that they're shorthand and that they're awfully inexact and that they're limited. So we try to be as careful and self-conscious about them as possible. And don't presume that we're all agreed at every moment about what they mean. Uh, um, another uh, complicated question is, is race grounded in biology or is it grounded in culture? And this is related, I shouldn't have got rid of my share screen. Let me go back to it. Um, this is related directly to what's over, what I put over here. This question of nature versus nurture, you may have encountered that in a class. And that is, is the individual shaped by innate factors? And that is things you're born with, you can't change them. They're innate, inborn, that's nature. Or is the individual shaped by factors determined by your surroundings? And that is the nurture, the environment and culture would fall of course um, under that umbrella of nurture. Most racist thinking falls on the side of nature, and that is that there are innate differences between blacks and whites, and that those differences cannot be changed, and that in fact, uh, they um, inevitably uh, uh, mark that black body as inferior somehow. Um, this is something that would have been commonly accepted in white society during a Harper's time. Um, th there, these ideas were very, very dominant in terms of nature versus nurture. And one other thing just to point out in terms of biology, keep in mind that the whole understanding of how human traits are inherited, we think about genetics, right? Um, genetics emerges in the mid 20th century. Uh, before that, we talked in terms of blood. People literally thought that the blood carried the traits so that when we say blood now, we usually mean that symbolically figure of speech, but back then when someone said black blood or white blood or some other kind of blood, they actually literally meant that the blood carried certain kinds of traits. So some of this terminology um, cannot be separated from where science was and where the common understanding of um, human character and human behavior was at the time. Um, I suspect that some of you have often uh, heard of the idea that race doesn't exist. Right, I mean, you know, race is, and the, and the term is, race is a social construction, right? It's just something that's made up. Uh, on the one hand, uh, this recognition that race uh, is a fabrication, it's something that's imagined, right? Um, it's a crucial step toward dismantling the belief that one group is inferior to another group based upon some alleged race traits. 
right? You can't measure race. It's not, there's no objective um, existence. The challenge is, and, and this is what I stress in my class, is that like a lot of imaginary things, the idea of race has material, co material consequences in the world. It can, on the one hand, not exist, but on the other hand, it does work. In other words, it affects people's lives. We can agree that race doesn't exist, but it's clear that race has major impacts on people's existence. It can be a life or death issue. So as an idea, it may not be grounded in reality, but it has powerful impacts in reality. Race is in many ways illogical as we think about it. It's in some ways a bogus concept, but it can affect your life choices. And I would further say, and this will set us up for when I start talking about racial categories, the assumption is that race is discernible by perception. In other words, that we can read race in people's faces in their bodies. This is the way in which race is connected to color. Um, it's a arbitrary formulation. And as we will see, it's not always true. But for race to matter and to be used in a stable fashion, you have to assume that you can identify race by looking at somebody. One of the reasons that we're in such a challenging period in this country around the issue of race is that we are gradually acknowledging not only that it's an arbitrary concept, but we're acknowledging that it's unstable as an idea. And just giving you an example of um, a, a, the way in which how we talk about it has changed a little bit, not enough, is that the census categories, if you look at the census, there are racial categories. Um, in the old days, by the way, census takers came to the door and looked at you and they marked down how they read what category you fell into. And by old days, I mean like 19th century. Um, race now is something that is self-identified and the categories have increased on the census form. And what I'm suggesting is that that reflects um, how complicated our ancestries are and our identities. We don't fit neatly into one or two um, categories of race, ethnicity, nationality. Uh, these are still approximations, but I, I'm suggesting that we're in the middle of a change, uh, which can make it very difficult for us to have coherent conversations about these issues. Um, I wanna turn now to the role of slavery and how that um, evolved, uh, helped the concept of race evolve in this country. Um, as you know, uh, African slavery, this enslavement of Africans took place throughout the Western Hemisphere, right? Um, a number of European countries participated in the slave trade. Uh, Britain uh, had its colonies in the Northern uh, Hemisphere uh, in what became America, also, by the way, Canada and some in the Caribbean. Uh, but the other dominant um, slave European countries, slaveholding European countries, were Spain, Portugal, and also uh, France, to a certain extent. Haiti, for example, was a colony of France. Um, historians have talked about some distinctions between the system of slavery um, as it evolved in the British model versus the system of slavery as it evolved in the, in particular, the Spanish and Portuguese, and also maybe the French model. Um, and that has a lot to do with the orientation of the given European country to the colony. One important distinction is that the British approach in what became the United States was not only to import slaves as labor to exploit the natural resources, but to settle what became the United States. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, uh, sending large numbers of people from Great Britain to settle in the United States as colonies. That's very different from how Spain and Portugal handled their colonies. There was no large scale settling of the colonies in South America, for example, by Spain or Portugal. Um, as a result, the Spanish and Portuguese colonizers, those who were uh, overseeing operations in these colonies, they were vastly outnumbered by, the, by enslaved Africans, vastly outnumbered. For example, Brazil. Um, there, by the way, there are more people of, of, of African descent in Brazil today than there are in the entire United States. 
if you look at the importing of African slaves to the Western Hemisphere, most of them went to South America. The vast majority of them went to South America. Uh, the United States got a fraction of them. So in terms of scale, it gives you a sense of the population proportions that existed um, outside of the American colonies. Now there's a constant, major consequence in terms of how race was categorized given that population distribution. In the, what you would call maybe the Hispanic colonies, especially Spain and Portugal, we tended to see a three-part racial scheme, black, colored, and white. And that is there was often an official recognition of what were called mixed blood people, people who had black and white ancestry. Um, now, this wasn't some kind of abstract uh, conceptual development. It had a lot to do with controlling the population. Um, keep in mind that the whites in these areas were vastly outnumbered by people of African descent. The strategy was to establish an intermediate racial group, this colored group, that might serve as a buffer between the outnumbered white European colonizers, the residents there, and the blacks, the people of African descent. And then in order for this to work, this middle group had to have some social distinction that separated itself from blacks and whites. And what actually happened, and in some cases it was, it was actually written into the law, um, the colored were higher in rank social status than blacks, but lower than whites. In the British colonies, largely, but not exclusively, there are other factors, but largely because of the population distribution, um, we see the e evolving of a binary system of racial categorization. Now, right from the start, this is not sufficient because of course there was a lot of theories about what the indigenous people, where they would fall. Um, and sometimes you would see red as placed as an, a, an, an additional factor. Um, the paradigm, the model, Model that gets restricted in a lot of ways to black and white, especially when one takes into account the uh, growth of slavery. What divides these two groups is essentially what I'm referring to, what others have called the color line, right? That's right here, right between blacks and whites. Now, this scheme might look straightforward and clear, right? Very simple. But there are major conceptual and practical problems. Um, and one of them I've already refer referred to, and that there was discussion of other racial groups, particularly the indigenous people, um, American Indians that were categories, categorized as red. Very, very early on, they became marginalized, even in a legal sense. Um, but there are other practical considerations which became problems. For example, what do you do with mixed blood people? Where do they fall? Here, there was at least this middle category, and that doesn't mean this is better. It does reflect a different kind of reality. There were certainly mixed blood people, quote unquote, in America, but where did they fall? And by the way, almost all of the mixed blood people were the result of the sexual exploitation of the enslaved African women. I'll come back to that in a minute. One response to this in the American setting was to establish the policy that the child would follow the condition of the mother. The child would follow the condition of the mother. And that is if the mother is enslaved and the father is white, which was almost always the case early on, the mixed child would be considered a slave. So the children that were had by white men on Af using African-American women, that just simply increased the population of enslaved people. This, of course, did nothing to discourage or punish the treatment of black women by white men that produced these mixed children. Um, another result of this scheme is the obsession in the United States with policing this color line, with figuring out where someone falls on the racial scheme. And there were a whole system of categories to identify racial mixtures because you had to figure out who, who, who was who. Um, Three of the terms, and I hope that these seem odd to you because I, I hope they're not in use anymore, but during um, the 19th century and certainly during uh, Francis Harper's time, these would have been commonly employed in talking about race. Uh, mulatto, 
would been re would refer to someone who was one half white, one half black. And again, these are terms in quotation marks, black and white. Uh, one half of African ancestry and one half of Western European ancestry that would have been identified as white. Um, quadroon, one fourth African ancestry. Octoroon, one eighth ancestry. And these categories, by the way, are not unique to America or to the, the British colonies or what became the United States. Um, you, there are visual representations uh, within Mexican art of um, different racial ethnic mixtures. There's a, there's, there's a language visually and in terms of um, spoken word, there's a language used to talk about those distinctions. So uh, a lot of the places where you have racial mixtures uh, in the Western hemisphere, you'll have a language used to describe them. In the United States, generally all of these categories fell under black. Um, do you see that right from the start, that makes no sense from a logical standpoint. If you have someone who is one eighth of African ancestry, what is the logic that renders them over here on the black side of the scheme? That logically that person you would think would be defined by their seventh eighth ancestry, right? The seventh eighth quote unquote blood. That's not how the system worked in the United States. The perceived danger is that if you allow someone with noticeable African ancestry into the white category, the so-called racial purity of whiteness becomes compromised. And never mind that racial purity doesn't exist. Never mind that that's also an artificial category. The language of racial purity in the United States evolves very quickly and it is used to justify policing this line between blacks and whites. And it doesn't clearly, it wasn't thought to take much of African ancestry in order to um, compromise that racial purity. The color line was enforced through both legal and extra legal means. And I want to talk a little bit about those. And again, the, these would all be definitely for or the late nights, there, there's an anxiety about racial purity and knowing someone's racial identity in the United States. And it emerges in countless ways. Just to give you one example, black and white blood supplies were segregated. They were kept separate in many parts of the United States and hospitals through the early part of the 20th century. In other words, if you were black and you needed a transfusion and there was no black blood available in certain places, you did not get a transfusion. It was, again, driven by the belief groundless, of course, but by the belief that black and white blood were somehow fundamentally incompatible, that there was a biological difference between blacks and whites that mattered, with, of course, blacks being read as inferior. The fear of racial mixing led to a whole generation of terms that um, referenced that anxiety, miscegenation, amalgamation, racial, racial mixing, all those terms referred to interracial sexual contact um, leading up to intermarriage, racial intermarriage. The phrase social equality was a code word in the South in the late 19th century. If you were advocating social equality, that meant you want blacks and whites to go to school together, you want them to ride together in trains, you want them to work together at jobs, and the opponent would say, the next thing you want is for them to marry. The next thing you is for them to have mixed children. This kind of language I'm arguing reflected um, this fascination and obsession with racial purity and a fear that the presence of blacks would um, endanger that. Um, we have also the generation of a social set of policies um, during the late, especially late 19th century called segregation. And the slang term was the Jim Crow system. Um, separate but equal. In 1896, we have a major Supreme Court decision that says that it's okay to have separate but equal. You can have separate water fountains for blacks and whites. You can have separate schools for blacks and whites. And of course, you won't be surprised that it was never equal. They were separate, but they were never equal. It justified legally segregation. And part of this um, legal system involved um, a series of laws put into place to uh, prevent uh, intermarriage. 
the persistence of um, the criminalization of racial intermarriage is really amazing. Um, you know, they, they may, it may strike you from a perspective of today that, that this is like really, really old news. Um, but it wasn't until 1967, over here on the right, there's another Supreme Court decision, Loving versus Virginia. It wasn't until that decision that laws against interracial marriage were struck down at the federal level. The case involved a white man and a black woman who married in Virginia, and they contested the law that said that their marriage was illegal. By the way, there's a recent film about this um, case. It's called Loving. I think it came out maybe two years ago. It's, it's worth tracking down. Again, this anxiety about racial mixing remains even evident today if you look at statements issued by extremist white supremacist groups. Um, talk about the polluting uh, 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 factor of race, the others. And in fact, you even see this fear emerging um, in how um, there's a perceived threat posed by immigrants. Um, there's language around how Mexican immigrants can sometimes be, sometimes be described as invaders or even as some kind of spreading infectious disease. What I'm suggesting is that this anxiety to maintain some kind of artificial, arbitrary, uh, unreal purity on this side means that anyone, whether it be black or some other group defined as other or foreign or different, th that group is perceived to be threatening. I put this other Supreme Court decision up here, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, because this is um, widely viewed as the major blow against segregation uh, it was a school desegregation case. Um, it, of course, didn't solve the problem. The problem is still uh, being dealt with, but at least on the legal front, it provided a repudiation of this decision in 1896. By the way, 1896 is only a few years after the publication of Iola Leroy. So you can see the direction of social policies about race that Harper had in mind that as she was writing that particular text. Um, one other thing about this, this anxiety in some quarters, thankfully more extreme quarters, but it goes back a long way. And I just wanna share a statement by Thomas Jefferson, whom I think you know, um, one of the quote unquote founding fathers, unquote, um, from his book called Notes on the State of Virginia. Um, he wrote several places that slavery was questionable in terms of its morality. Um, but he also really wrestled with the idea of what do you do um, if you free, if you end slavery and free the Africans, people of African descent. By the way, he was a slaveholder and he did not free his own slaves in his lifetime. So the contradictions we see in the American system uh, are embodied um, just as one example in someone like Thomas Jefferson. Um, he wrote about what do you do with the freed slaves? who are freed blacks. And here's his speculation. This is from his book. This unfortunate difference of color, he's referring to blackness, he, he's calling it an unfortunate difference of color, and perhaps of faculty, that is, he's even speculating that maybe blacks are inferior in terms of their abilities. This unfortunate difference of color and perhaps of faculty is a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of these people. And in, in his book, he compares slavery in Greece and Rome to slavery in the United States. And one point he makes is that there was no racial difference between the Greek, Greek slaves and freed people in Greece and Rome. And here's his conclusion. Among the Romans, emancipation required but one effort, and that is to free the slaves and slavery. The, the Roman slave when made free might mix with without staining the blood of his master. Look at that language, staining the blood. What does that mean? But with us, that is Americans, with the American system of slavery, a second step is necessary, unknown to history. It's never been done before. When freed, he, the black, is to be removed beyond the reach of mixture. What Jefferson is saying is that the only way he can imagine ending slavery without destroying American uh, society is to free the slave, to free the black, and then to move him somewhere, move them outside of the reach of mixture. And what that meant was to have send them back to Africa. Even someone like Abraham Lincoln, when he um, uh, was thinking about emancipation and the 
challenge of ending slavery, his first thought was he would end slavery and facilitate the removal of blacks back to Africa. What we see here is an ongoing failure to imagine a truly multiracial society. And it goes all the way back to the founding of the United States and it continues throughout the 19th century. One of the manifestations of this concern with the color line, the boundary between black and white is the fascination in American literature and culture uh, with the phenomenon of what was called racial passing. And I think I may not have put that term up there, but that's a phenomenon that we see referenced in Iola Leroy quite a bit. Racial passing is the idea that a light-skinned black person might decide to live as white. And that is someone who legally uh, is uh, understood to be in this category, category decides to live as white. You see again how this manifests the whole illogic of the system. The black white system of racial categorization only works if you can depend upon visual markers of race. What happens if the person of one eighth black ancestry or maybe even one fourth black ancestry, what happens if that person doesn't look black? What does it mean to look black by the way? But what happens if that person is legally quote unquote black, but looks white? The system, in other words, is fundamentally unstable, which unfortunately often simply increases the desperate attempts in, at moments in American society to enforce the boundary. But there's um, a number of narratives. It shows up in movies. It shows up in novels uh, by blacks and whites um, dealing with racial passing. Um, I think the, one of the more recent films is a film called uh, Human Stain, came out maybe 10 years ago. It's a, uh, a sub theme in a number of uh, texts. It still is an issue that people think about. Ask yourself, why does it matter? And I think it helped that question helps you understand how racial categories are functioning to provide certain kinds of, of uh, claims of superiority and inferiority. So let me sum a lot of this up by highlighting the way in which um, anti-Black prejudice or racism um, developed into a set of interlocking factors. Um, and I put it in the form of an equation. Uh, and I guess what I'm suggesting is that um, over time, nobody sat down and worked this up, right? I mean, this nobody got together and said, well, we need to justify uh, how we're treating Africans, how we view Africans, how we maintain slavery, uh, how we maintain uh, prejudice, prejudicial legal systems. But what I'm suggesting is that over time, certain ideas became associated, they became linked, and they became connected so that when you pulled one up, you often pulled others of these up. The color, of course, it starts there. Um, and it's arbitrary, hard to define, very slippery, imprecise, but it became commonly used and is still commonly used. That quickly became identified with African, um, which think about religion, quickly became linked to pagan, heathen, that is non-Christian, linked to sin, often linked to sex. The whole issue of sexuality and racial stereotypes goes back a long way. Um, some people speculated that the dark skin of Africans came from disease. Now, I don't know whether maybe in Western Europe that was tied somehow to what was called the Black Plague, which decimated the population. It may just simply go back to the extent to which blackness and dark skin was allied to images of the devil. Um, but the idea that it somehow, blackness was somehow connected to something that could be caught, an infection um, was established early on. We see it linked to a, an alleged lack of cleanliness, black dirt, um, blacks linked as um, connected to animals as much as they're connected to humans. The whole issue of what a slave is became linked uh, certainly within the American system to blackness. So the, these terms often take on power because they supply the basis for their opposite, right? Um, to know what a slave is means to know what it is to be free. 
gender works in this way too, right? To define male in terms of what's not female or feminine. Um, blacks became identified with property through the idea of slavery, that is chattel slavery. Blacks became identified with the physical, with the body versus the mind, with rash, rationality. Um, blacks, Africa, pagan, linked to civ uncivilized and of course to inferior. One of the things that this cluster of ideas um, leads us to is that when you pull one out, it doesn't necessarily dismantle the whole interconnected network. So that when slavery ends, you can cross this one out. So in Harper's time, Harper was uh, active politically and, and writing during slave time and all the way to the end of the century. She fought against slavery and she and others may have hoped that when you ended slavery, you would dismantle the racist linkages among these other ideas, all of which are negative. And that of course did not happen. These are also inconsistent. Right? You would like to think that if a, a, a person of African descent or an African became Christian, therefore pagan no longer applied, that you would no longer feel you could justify holding that person in slavery. It didn't take long for most slaves within the United States and slave people to become Christians. That did not end slavery. The rationalization was fluid enough, even though it was inconsistent, that you could justify continuing to hold slaves even when they were Christian, even though one of your initial justifications for slavery was that they were pagan and that God in fact um, justified you putting them into slavery. And what about slavery itself? You might think of, of that attacking slavery would allow you to attack all these other categories. Um, think about how frustrating it is to try to break down these racist ideas because of the extent to which these categories were so mutually reinforcing. And one of the last things I want to share is um, uh, pulled from this chart. And that is the arguments in favor of slavery and that turned into arguments in favor of segregation, in favor of uh, 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 racial prejudice after slavery drew upon different bodies of knowledge. So there's the whole thing went from the Bible. The story of Cain and Abel was often referred to as justifying slavery. As you know, Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's children. Cain killed Abel. Cain was cursed and thrown out and marked. And the justification was that that mark of Cain, the curse of God, was blackness. You can see how conveniently some of these ideas were brought into, were mobilized uh, in the attempt to justify treating people who looked or were labeled black or African in a particular way. Um, Christianity was uh, very commonly used to justify slavery. By the way, there's always resistance to these ideas. I don't want you to not think about that. So many people like Harper would use Christianity to attack slavery, to attack the justifications for prejudice. Science was used to justify slavery. Um, and that becomes increasingly important in the 19th century with the rise of anthropology, with the um, rise of theories of evolution in Darwin, um, as there became competing bodies of knowledge, al alternatives to religion, we find science. And you would think, well, the objectivity of science would lead to more accurate and fair readings of differences that are marked as racial. That didn't happen. Science as well was mobilized to provide justifications for alleged racial difference and slavery, and then later for treatment. Then finally, culture, which is a catch-all term, but for a long time, it had been one of the other ways of understanding human experience that would provide justifications for slavery. And the, the most blunt way to put it is people, whites in Western Europe felt that slaves did not have any meaningful, coherent culture. They were not civilized and therefore, they actually were benefited by slavery because it exposed them to Western European civilization. These could be mobilized in um, interlocking ways, even though religion and science were often competing forms of knowledge. And again, it provided this dense foundation of thinking and theorizing that led to justifications 
for slavery and after slavery ended, justifications for um, um, differential treatment of blacks based upon race. Um, there's a lot more to say, especially about Harper, but I do wanna leave some time for questions or discussion. Uh, and if you don't have anything to say, I have more to say, um, but let me stop there. Um, that was so amazing, uh, Professor Yarborough. I'm just, I know I, I learned so much from you. I think you have some of your former students uh, here too. Uh, uh, Sabela Grimes just left, but um, he mentioned that um, he's now a professor of dance at USC and just wanted to do a shout out to you, had, had you at UCLA. I think, um, I'm not sure if um, Professor Spires is in the, in, in the space, but just wanted to say that you have some um, former students, not just um, me, <laughs> but also uh, in your, your teaching at UCLA. And I had some questions uh, from the students that I was mm -hmm. kind of, um, and I think uh, one of the reasons students why I really wanted us to uh, hear from Professor Yarborough is, um, this is speaking from personal experience that when, as a teacher, sometimes I'll notice as I'm walking down, you know, like in, as, in Fauché hallways, um, students might, might say things like that's so racist, you know, or this is so racist or you're so racist. And this kind of like term that gets used a lot without a lot of historical um, unpacking sometimes about what, where racist thinking comes from. And, um, and as you had started out in the very beginning, uh, really talking, taking us through the, the, the fact that these terms black and white race um, are, are both are figures of speech that are also rooted in real historical events and, and laws and ways of, do, of being and, and, and has real impact. So the kind of idea of like race is being invented. So Jesus earlier uh, on, I don't know if, you're, if you can unmute, you had asked this question about na the nature versus nurture section um, because you're taking it in a psychology class. Um, would you like to unmute and maybe ask your question? Cause I thought it was interesting. Yes, hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my question was that in psychology, we're learning about nature and nurture in children. So are certain behaviors in children um, hereditary and passed down? So part of what I was- uh, Or are some taught to them? My question was, do you think racism is her no, keep hereditary going. or passed down? Mm -hmm. No, hereditary or taught. And, and can you repeat the last part of your question? Do you think racism is hereditary oh, and passed down from the parent or okay. is taught? Okay. Yeah, um, two, two things. Uh, first, um, the um, nature, nature nurture argument or debate will go on forever. Um, and I think one of the things that's useful about looking at it in this context is that those terms, uh, we constantly want simple schemes, right? We want to be able to say it's either A or B. And what we're increasingly learning is that we may need to move beyond that simple choice in order to understand how people uh, develop. We're discovering, for example, that environmental factors shape brain growth, which in turn shapes how individuals think and learn. Things that we thought might be innate are turning out maybe to be more dependent upon uh, nurture or environmental factors, um, and but we're still teasing all that apart. Um, with regard to racism, racism is an attitude. It is a way of thinking. And I'm trying, I, I'm really, sus I'm suspicious of uh, absolute statements. I don't make many, but I think I'll make one. Um, racism is taught. Uh, no one is born racist. Racist is an attitude, a system of thinking. So let me, let, me, let me stop there. But yes, it is something that can be taught. And the assumption is that if it can be taught, it can be untaught. The problem is in order to unteach something, you have to, it's not just simply result of a conversation. You have to think about all of the other things in society that reinforce and reward that kind of thinking. And a lot of these ideas that I've been talking about today took centuries to develop. It may well take centuries for us to move out of them. Uh, your generation is going to play a crucial part in moving us out of them. Um, thank you for that. And I think we're going to keep unpacking this nature versus nurture idea, students, because 
you know, um, it's tricky because then how you, if you, what about racial pride, for example, by a P POC groups or, um, you know, groups of color, you know, who kind of like are proud of being, you know, Asian American or proud of being, so in, in a sense that there's a, is there a reclaiming of um, racial, like the, the nature part of the argument of race, you know, um, yeah. in, in those kinds of gestures? Well, if I could, I mean, because this will probably get us into a few other things. I mean, I think um, a lot of this is very context specific. It doesn't mean it's not real. Mm -hmm. um, groups form affiliations um, and bond sometimes because of external pressure mm -hmm. and sometimes because of internal choice. Um, there's nothing false about being proud of being part of a particular kind of community. Um, that's not inborn, right? I mean, if someone of African descent is raised in Russia, like Alexander Pushkin, who's one of the leading Russian poets, he was of African descent, um, he speaks Russian, uh, he writes Russian poetry. Is he Russian? Is he Black? Is he going to be proud of being an African American? Is he going to be proud of being African? A lot of our sources of pride comes because of our multiple affiliations. You may be proud of being from Los Angeles after watching the NBA finals. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, are, we have multiple identities and a lot of those are choices. Some of them are identities that are put on us and we can choose either to try to accept them or reject them. Um, but I guess I just want us to hold on to these ideas loosely, not because they aren't real or they can't have real emotional impacts, but because they aren't always predetermined and predictable. Um, and I think we need to take responsibility for choosing our identities, even as we recognize the power of social categories to push us in one direction or another. Sometimes we want to go in that direction, sometimes we don't. Um, I'm going to ask, um, this is a, either Tiffany or Caitlin, because they had questions about racial passing. Like Tiffany right. had a question about um, if it's a choice, how does it impact the community that you were born into? I mm -hmm. um, wanted to know about that. And Caitlin, I think you had a, a, a question about racial passing as well. Would you like to unmute and, and maybe, because I didn't write it down, but I know it, you put it on the chat. Caitlin, are you present? Can you guys hear me? Um, yes, yes. Explaining a bit like how in the book I like when um Robert Johnson was given the opportunity mm -hmm. to be part of the what so called like white section of mm -hmm. the where he could serve he chose mm -hmm. not to and like was that part was that partly because he felt like if he did that he was denying that blackness inside of him mm -hmm. or was it like he's gonna betray his black side of mm -hmm. him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. It's early in the book, and Robert is uh, an enslaved person, and he l looks light-skinned enough that he could pass. And when he wants to enlist in the Union Army to fight the civil in the Civil War, he's told that he has a choice. He can go into enlist as a white person or as a black. And by the way, the U.S. military was broken into black and white up until the Korean War. In other words, even the military was segregated between black and white. Um, uh, I think one of the things to look for in the novel is what is the motivation behind each of the black characters who can pass, but who decides not to pass. Robert says, if I passed, I feel out of place. I think he says, I'd be like a cat in a strange attic. Mm -hmm. um, for him, it's a level of comfort. You could put that maybe under culture. He was raised uh, in that community and he's comfortable in that community. I do think that Harper is interested in talking about a sense of responsibility and duty to one's community. And I think Robert uh, shares that. Um, so in that case, um, his choice is both, um, this is the life I know and I'm comfortable with it, and also a choice to be where he feels he is best need, most needed. He talks about, um, I wanna be a leader in my community. Being in the black, side of the military will allow me to play that kind of role. Um, the question um, that you mentioned um, about the connection between passing and one's community, 
uh, that's often part of the drama in the novels and movies that talk about passing. In other words, how does the person who passes relate to his or her family when they may not be able to pass? In other words, can he, there's sometimes a very tragic scene where the character who passes sees a relative and can't acknowledge the person in public because that would give away their masquerade, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, I, it's hard to tell how common passing was or is, or even if it's something that people focus on that much. I think it shows up in the popular culture because of what I'm suggesting as the symbolic importance given to racial categories. But, um, you know, you, some of you know that this, these DNA tests are getting popular, right? There's even TV shows where people get their DNA test and all of a sudden you find out the background. Um, one of the things that the DNA test shows is that there are a lot of people who view themselves as white who have racial ancestry that is not all white. Um, you know, people um, of color have often just taken for granted that they often have a mixture of different kinds of racial ancestries. Um, those kinds of understandings you would hope would gradually break down the idea that there is um, a difference. Um, one other thing about passing, there are other kinds of passing. It doesn't have to be blacks passing as white. Um, individuals pass if they can see that their life chances improve by identifying with a different group. Uh, there are cases of women who have present themselves as men in certain settings. There's a woman a novel uh, or a biography of a, of, of a woman who played in jazz band for years as, and presenting herself as male. Um, you could argue, even though sexual orientation is not something that's easily read on the body or read on the body at all, that there are individuals who have um, not uh, been very real in things because a phenomenon of passing from one group to another is all about status and power and privilege. If privilege was equally distributed in society, uh, people would largely not worry about what category they fell in. Um, so these novels uh, um, talk about privilege, choices, uh, affiliations, what makes you feel responsible and proud, what makes you feel dishonest, especially family connections, because those are very powerful for her characters. Uh, you're muted. Uh, I was going to say thank you so much. Um, we have a contingency of students who have a, a field trip that they need to go to. So I'm going to, if you are in tech, um, I'm going to dismiss you. I'm going to ask um, the rest of my students to just give me a, uh, maybe three more minutes to, to wrap up and thank uh, Professor Yarborough. There was a, a cluster of questions from Andy that I wanted to pose um, around um, change, like how can you change someone um, who is racist and a question on, can you act a race? There was some questions on the chat about whitewashing or being another race, I think. Uh, and so concerns about, so those are two separate questions, but I thought I wanted to talk more, uh, maybe end on a note about how can you change this um, and resistance. And I also wanted to kind of put to students, it's not just changing it in others, you know, but changing it in ourselves, you know, like what are some of the, the ways to, to kind of see that. So if you wanted to just address, um, uh, he might be gone now, but um, I just wanted to maybe end with that question. Mm -hmm. How can you, how do you change anti-racist uh, thinking? Yeah, yeah. Um, boy, in one minute. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I do think that um, we need to look at earlier models of resistance. Uh, Frances Harper is one model. I mean, she used her talent as a writer to um, present narratives that she hoped would have an impact both on the black community and the white community. But she was also a political activist in women's rights movement and black civil rights movements in the late 19th century. Um, I guess one of the things that tells us is that um, these are questions of political policy that may, um, and one way to address it would be timely, right? Vote, um, participate in the political structures and, and platforms that allow us to change um, the legal structures. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind that these are grounded in issues of culture. 
And changing the laws does not always change people's minds. And I think, therefore, you have to think about storytelling. That's one of the, the things that Harper is doing. Um, you have to think about um, addressing both let me let me rephrase it this way: addressing the problem from a position of building alliances. Um, most uh, movements within the black community have had to focus on addressing the white community because blacks numerically do not constitute um, a large enough group in the United States to to shape their own political status. Mm -hmm. Slavery would not have ended if blacks had been the only ones mobilized to end slavery. It's just a reality. So thinking political change of a fundamental level has happened most readily when there has been um, alliances, coalitions, uh, talking across boundaries, finding people with similar kinds of goals and working toward bringing about change. Um, will there be people that you cannot reach? That's always been true. That's always been true. It was true in the 19th century in the battle against slavery. Um, in some cases, some people will have to be confronted uh, and um, have change made despite them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's what voting sometimes does. Um, but I guess what I would suggest is that there has always been resistance. There has been change, right? I wouldn't be sitting here uh, if people hadn't uh, done things in the 50s and 60s that allowed me to go to the schools that I ended up going to and to get the training that I ended up getting. I'm not here because I'm special. I'm here because changes were made to systems that had uh, prevented people like me from getting into positions like this. Um, look for moments of change. And when you participate in these kinds of changes, um, both be patient, but also be vocal and direct. Um, there, there is some ignorance there, that, and there are occasions where people, once they become aware, and I think the recent Black Lives Matter movement has shown some of this, that there are people that once they become educated or aware of certain things, they become involved in a different way. You can say, why did it take having videos of violence done unto people when that violence had been done for generations? It's a reality that the video was more powerful and presented in a in a particular kind of writing or talking about it might not. Whether it's right or wrong is in some ways irrelevant. It's a reality that now people are becoming aware. Taking that awareness and pushing it to in certain constructive directions is um, a valuable manifestation of this kind of resistance. But I can't stress enough how important it is to build coalition, to build connections among communities. Um, that is gonna be crucial in terms of moving us uh, in the way we need to be moved. Thank you so much, Professor Yarbrough. That's so incredibly generous. Um, students, I'm gonna send a quick text message to Mr. Gramajo uh, if you are here um, with us. Um, I know you have period uh, one right now. Um, so I'm going to dismiss my students and everyone else. I'd like you to join me in um, just thanking Professor Yarbrough with a either a clap. I saw a lot of thank yous uh, and appreciations in the chat for your time with us. Um, and um, I did want to say that we have a Padlet um, that uh, I would like students to leave more questions and thoughts and comments and guess you're more than welcome to um, visit us on this Padlet. I'm just going to Put the um, um, I'm just gonna. Uh, sorry, give me one second. I'm going to put the link onto the chat in a second, um, so that you can uh, continue the conversation in this um, in in this format. Um, otherwise, let's see, copy to clipboard and multitasking. Um, quite a lot of us are still here. I'm just uh, <laughs> kind of surprised. My class is usually about 30, uh, uh, 25. So I have, I have quite a bit of people here at this moment. So that's the Padlet students and guests, if you would like to leave some comments there. Um, and otherwise, thank you so much, Professor uh, Yarbrough um, for joining us. Um, I, and I hope to keep you obviously updated about what we're doing. Oh, you are muted. 
thank you so much for uh, being so alert and awake. At least I didn't see anybody obviously sleeping uh, on, in the Zoom. Um, but thank you so much for your attention. And uh, maybe I'll see you at UCLA or somewhere else. Uh, take care and stay well. I hope you and your family stay well. Thank you.